Good afternoon, and as Executive Director of the Athenaeum, I'd like to welcome you to what I think is one of the most anticipated events of the Dance Festival. It's where Tyler, our Artistic Director, has a chance to unpack the program that we're going to be seeing on Friday and Saturday night. Would you snap off those cell phones um, now? And I also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Northern Trust, as well as the many individual sponsors, many of whom are in the audience right now, who have made the Dance Festival possible and the proceeds from the Dance, Dance Festival make it possible for the Athenaeum to do a lot of programs and services during the whole course of the year. So we thank all of you for your support, and please join me in welcoming Tyler Engel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think I'm going to start by introducing our musicians, because they are already right in front of you. We have um, fabulous husband and wife piano duo, Susan Walters and Jeff Moore. Our first violin, Lydia Hong. Um, second violin, Nellie Kim. They're both also part of our New York City Ballet Orchestra back in New York. Thanks for coming. We have Meta Weiss on cello. <laughs> and, or is it Meta? Meta Weiss, excuse me. And Isha Wayman on viola. So thank you for being with us. So as Molly said, this is just my chance to sort of walk you through the program that I've put together um, and to tell you what I think is interesting about it. Um, and something that I had been thinking about doing for several years here is a ballet that Alexei Rutmansky choreographed back in 2001 um, for the, I think it's called the Copenhagen Festival Ballet when he was you know, first starting out. And he decided to choreograph to Ravel's Bolero. Um, Interesting because everybody has ideas about what, I mean, you know, everybody knows the music, everybody has some associations with the music, and what he chose to do with it was much different than anything that I had ever come across before. Um, that being said, before, after programming it, after being very excited that it was here, a friend of mine um, steered me to a radio lab. Does anyone here listen ever to public radio? Or radio lab's fantastic. They do these really in-depth stories about fabulous subjects. And there was a radio lab about Bolero. Um, and basically, and I never knew this, six years, almost to the day, after finishing Bolero, Ravel had almost completely lost his ability to communicate. He lost his letters, he lost words, and he became obsessed with repeating patterns, i.e., can we have the first... <laughs> I mean, beautiful, and apparently he, you know, was in, I mean, and if you, you really, I'll, I'll put a link up on the library's website, you should really listen to this radio lab. Apparently he was in a pink bathing suit, running out to go to the beach, and he jumped off the front step, and this um, theme came to him, um, and it's a beautiful theme, except the theme, you know, years earlier in his life, he would have expanded into this marvelous thing. That theme is repeated exactly for 340 bars. The only thing that changes is the orchestration. Um, so, you know, think about that. Guys, can you come out? Can maybe just set up for the opening pose. Um, so, the reason I bring this up is because it was another facet. I mean, I think musicians, when they play it, probably not even halfway through are thinking that they're going mad. Um, because it's so repetitive and they're thinking like, when am I going to ever get out of this? But hearing about the process um, by which him writing Bolero was almost the first symptom of this um, 
degenerative, uh, and actually I have the name of it right here, it was called frontal temporal dementia. Um, and, and, and basically one front of his brain started to deteriorate, but because it was shutting off his language sensors, all of these other creative um, synapses in his brain were being opened up. So be, you know, he became wildly fascinated with colors and, and vivid, uh, vivid projections. And this sort of adds a layer of texture, whether it's creepy, whether it's interesting. I think knowing this adds something to the music. You definitely hear it differently after knowing this. Um, and also, I think you watch the ballet differently after knowing it. Because, as you all know, Alexei Ratmansky, who choreographed this, loves an internal story, loves internal dialogue, loves for, even if it's only steps, he'd tell you that there's no story at all in this ballet. But there are many stories going on, and everybody on the stage has a distinct personalities. And these personalities are April Janjaruzo. Everyone here is from the American Ballet Theater. Um, ABT's newest soloist, Skylar Brandt, congratulations. Uh, Christine Shevchenko, who has already been to the festival, but last time you saw her, she was in the corps de ballet, and since her marvelous performance here, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> her own work, she is now also a soloist with uh, the American Ballet Theater. Thank you for coming again. And then our three fabulous gentlemen, Gabe Stone Shayer, Sterling Baca, and Patrick Frenette. So just the beginning? Okay. We're going to start the beginning. So you can sort of see in the beginning, you don't know what's happening. Also, I'll tell you that the lights start to dim up and everybody has a number on their costumes, one through six. Um, anyone guess what April's number is? One, she's the first one to dance. So she comes out and she has got a number. So you're looking at these people, you're thinking, is it a competition? What are they doing? They're all looking straight at you. I mean, you know, the ballet starts, everybody's looking at you, and everybody continues to look at you, even though one of their own members is coming and dancing on her own. So really, this, you know, there are stories happening. We don't know what's really going on. Um, another thing, uh, can you come and demonstrate where you thought you were finally out of the water? So the group, as you'll start to notice as the ballet goes along, the group is very sort of uh, sedate, almost underwater. They're supposed to be kind of fuzzy, blurry, all very precisely together, mind you, but not as vividly drawn as the person who's currently, or the people who are currently dancing. Um, and Alexei loves to sort of demonstrate his dynamic sometimes. Wait, well, you can do it better. You can, you can arrive all in the one and then slow it down. So he loves this sort of thing where it's a fast movement that ends quickly but then doesn't actually end. And we're gonna see one more example of that with Gabe Solo, which we think is the B flat clarinet, or the, yeah, well, we go. <laughs> Do you wanna hear a little bit before? Maybe, yeah, a couple, yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. We weren't quite all together. Nice job. Nice job. Gabe, can you show the can you show the first yeah, into the into the arabesque? And hit the arabesque position a little harder. So, I mean, you see the same thing that he's demonstrating with this like attitude coming around. He gets to the attitude, but the attitude extends, and then he gets to the last position, and he's still extending through the music. And did you notice what the group was doing when he was dancing? All kinds of things. You know, they're moping around in the back. <laughs> they're reiterating some of the steps that April had done in her first solo. Um, so, Alexi sort of, he mines the music, even in its massively repetitive nature, for little differences. And he brings back his repetition, I think, in, in, a, in an incredibly um, interesting way. So it never, your eye never tires of it. You sort of, you get into a, a daze and all of a sudden the ballet's over. So make sure that you're like watching every little bit. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, now I'd like to welcome to the stage Sarah Mearns and Jared Angle. Thank you. <clears throat> Sarah and Jared, several years ago, had the opportunity to work with um, Italy's most famous, currently the most famous ballerina, even though she's in her 80s, um, Carla Fracci and her husband Beppe on Swan Lake when they did a guesting with the Rome Opera Ballet. And Carla was always known for the stories that she told on the stage. And these two had, I think, a pretty exceptional time working with them on the storytelling aspect of Swan Lake. And it's interesting for many reasons, but for me especially interesting because at the New York City Ballet, we're not particularly known for our story ballets. You know, we're known for our repertory work. Um, and then here you have two dancers that worked very hard and very successfully, I might add, to tell a story ballet, which is not, you know, it's kind of like being fish out of water. Oh, thank you. Um, I have, yeah, it was a very interesting, I have to say, experience being in Rome and, and doing a different production than we normally do at City Ballet. And one day we were in the studio working on it and uh, Beppe walks in and he has like a vibrant personality. He's just like so excited to be there. And he walks over and I don't even remember what part of the potato we were doing. I think it was towards the end. Oh, in the beginning? Yeah. Okay. And the, and the white swan potato. And we were doing this step and all of a sudden he starts saying, Sarah, you have to act like sometimes you're a girl, but then you're a swan, but then you're a girl, and then you're a swan. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> how do I do that? <laughs> so we like spent like an hour like trying to figure this out, and I don't think I actually figured it out there, but now I understand what he's saying because as the swan, you're not really an animal, but you're not really a woman. You have to be both in the same character, and to actually achieve that balance takes years and years of working on it. And after 10 years of doing it now, I, I feel like I've kind of grasped what that actually means. And I don't know, have I successfully been able to, do you feel that? Well, also this, the, Beppe was not a dancer, but he came in to coach our potted rehearsal. So we were like, what is this theater director doing? Uh, but he had worked with Visconti, I guess, at La Scala, and he was like, had you know his bona fides, uh, but it was very funny that he went through step by step, like when she was a swan, and when she was a girl, and when she was a swan, and when she was a girl. So it was like being a bit like schizophrenic. Um, actually, just because I didn't know that it was that very first diagonal down, that you're a swan, that you're a girl, you're a swan, you're a girl. So maybe if you can do the beginning, in those walks, you know, like, yeah, from the beginning until maybe that corner. Change of plan, guys. Um, we're going to go from um, the... Do you have where Jared steps? Mm. 
Actually, wait, hold on. Yeah, it's good. To, it's good if you if you're down. Sorry to make you go. To, girls hate this. Thank you, Sarah. Same thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can watch the whole thing. That was beautiful. Okay, so are you a girl or are you a swan for that part? I thought I knew. You don't know still. Well, no, it's interesting because I actually have never, you, she's very involved in her own, I mean, he's picking her up. You know, she's, they've had a very scary first encounter. She is like, white scared. She's like running for the hills. And he finds her and he's, he's picking her up out of this position. She's not sure if she's trusting him, but you really, it's like a very involved, she doesn't know yet. And then all of a sudden when you went around, you were looking at him for the first time. And it's a weird step to be looking, just like do the, you don't even have to be on point, but just show them. So she's here and she's walking around. It's like an inside fuete and she looks, it's a, it's a kind of awkward situation. Yeah, it's fascinating. It is a hard balance. <laughs> um, so the other, um, the other interesting thing, especially because we're of the New York City Ballet tradition that I thought was fascinating, and I will say in full disclosure, I've not been able to corroborate this in a book or in you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica, but a lot of ballet is oral history. A lot of the stories that we have, even the choreography that we dance is passed down Orally. I mean, until we had videotapes, it was really just someone's notes and then what someone remembered the ballet to be. Um, that being said, Alexandra Danilova, famous, famous Russian ballerina, once told a dear friend of ours, Aidan Mooney, that the version of the White Swan Padada that we all know that's generally accepted today as the version of the White Swan Padada is actually not what Lev Ivanov and Petipov first staged when they restaged it from the very, very old one. It was actually the, virgin that, the version that Balanchine redid for the Ballet Russe in the 20s. So this is sort of a, take it or leave it. I'm just, I thought it was an interesting story. That being said, we were at the Kennedy Center many years ago and I had just finished my stage rehearsal of Swan Lake with Maria Kurowski and my boss, Peter Martins, came up to me and said, you know, this step just doesn't look right. There's a step in the pot of where the girl does these chasse arabesques. She closes, she does a shoulder sit, and then you have to slide her down to the point of her toe, and she's an arabesque. And he just said, it just doesn't look right. It looks finicky, it looks like you're doing lots of things, it looks terrible. And he was like, it doesn't look terrible, it just doesn't look right. And he said, you know, Balanchine told me that you don't move your arms, that it, I mean, was this how you remember? I don't remember the exact words, but he said, once you put the girl in this shoulder lift, you don't, it's, you do the entire thing with your elbows. I was thinking, how do you do that? Doesn't work. And sure enough, a step that, I mean, that Jared and I both had been, not struggling with, but just not doing as well as we would like to for years, immediately clicked into place. I mean, and I actually felt, I mean, it was amazing. It was one of those times where I actually felt that Balanchine had just told me something. Like I could, you could feel the man's genius sort of fixing your problems from beyond the grave. Um, but if you could show us, um, if you could show us this, I don't even know if you can demonstrate it badly once. Yeah, maybe do it badly first and then do the good one. 
But we'll give you we'll give you music too. We'll, so this is the yeah. Yeah, maybe you know, a couple bars. <laughs> the difference it's super subtle but did you see it at one point he moved he moved both of his arms so she's on his shoulder he moves both of his arms and think she's in a tutu pink tights on the legs you see these arms coming over I mean you got all right arms you know we have the same arms but it's like you don't want to see the man's arms you want to see, I mean do the second one one more time sorry just just without yeah just without music I mean, nothing moves. And she's changing and getting into this amazing, I mean, thank you very much. That was exceptional. Yeah, you too, Thank you, thank you. Um, it's really, it's the little things that make the biggest difference, um, especially when you're telling a story like this. You don't want to be encumbered by a lot of arm. You just want things to happen as naturally as possible. Um, I actually always sort of leave one thing out for the lectures just because, you know, you got to buy a ticket, come see the show. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, really come see a show, though. Um, but it makes sense because this is a, we've commissioned a brand new pot de from Justin Peck, uh, the new resident choreographer from the New York City Ballet. Um, and I'd sort of don't want to talk about it. I still haven't seen like the whole thing yet. I haven't been able to come to all the rehearsals and I think it's fabulous just to come see something that no one has ever seen before and you're seeing it for the first time on Nantucket. It's pretty cool. Um, but one thing I would like to do is if we can take it, do you know, um, do you remember that piece that I made you practice the whole thing but we're just doing the end of it? <laughs> um, Betsy, I hate to do this to you. Do we have that speaker anywhere? Actually, maybe I can just play from my phone to the mic. I want you to hear the difference because the, the person who composed this, Sufjan Stevens, originally wrote the music um, and it was an entire electronic score. And then many years later, another um, composer, songwriter named Bryce Desner suggested to him that he thought it would work well um, with strings as a, as a quartet. He wasn't so convinced, but the difference is, a, is like, is astounding. Like, I don't think Justin would have been allowed to do his first ballet at City Ballet to the electronic version of the score, but the electronic of this version of the score gave us this wonderful um, string quartet version. And if you bear with me, oh, here it is. Have you guys heard this? <laughs> oh, it's not working. Sorry, one second, technical difficulties. Oh, we do have the, we have the speaker. <laughs>
But we can still hear, actually, the, uh, well, let's take it a different direction. What do you guys think of the music? You can answer honestly. The first time I heard the whole thing, I was like, kind of not convinced, but I'm like sort of a traditionalist when it comes to chamber music. Um, and I don't know, let's go around, get a poll. Wait, this is better. Let's do, let, you can play first and then tell us what you, what you sort of think about it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so it's a whole different feeling though. Like for me with the strings, it's immediate and, and sort of very, um, I don't know, it feels much more kinetic. The electronic version sounds like you're in a cloud somewhere, but now I will give you the mic and ask you how you feel about the music. For this movement specifically, yeah. um, I think that it's a lot more direct when it like you immediately are Pulled in, where is that? Uh, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> that is a. Uh, the other uh, thing is less, um, like, in your face. Uh, there's like more subtlety to it. Uh, it does sound similar, I think, but uh, like the other movements, I actually prefer the electronic to yeah. some other things. And there's just big differences, but you can hear similarities. Can someone else talk now? I love it. I think it's great on, yeah. on instruments, and um, I kind of feel like a rock star because <laughs> we don't usually get to play this kind of music, so it's really fun. I like it. Um, I think it's really interesting. Whenever you do an arrangement of something, it sort of changes the piece. So this is the string version of something electronic, and I think it's a different interpretation. It's not supposed to be the other thing. It's, it's a completely new piece and I think a lot of it lies really well in the strings and then some of it is awkward and easier to play on a computer, but it still sounds <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think it's sort of similar to what you said, Tyler, that it's, it's a lot more, um, like the electronic version sounds to me like you're sort of drifting, and, but I think when you play it on string instruments, it has a lot more direction it feels just sort of gutsier like it's more organic or something um, yeah and I, and I like that about it but it's really cool for us to hear the electronic version I just didn't even know that so maybe we'll play it a little differently now who knows <laughs> okay um, n next anyway look forward to seeing I mean this is a really cool thing we're also bookending the intermission with Justin's works, which we've never really done that before because it's called also duet, as in two different parts. Um, so you're going to see one section before the intermission and we're going to try to have that be so, have that so resonate with you that you stay in that world until you come back for the second half. Um, and, I, and I think you will. Um, also as a side note, we have a former member of the New York City Ballet that's done the costumes uh, made by hand for Justin's new piece, so that's kind of, that's kind of fun. Her name's Ellen Ostrom. Um, next on the program is a piece that I've been trying to have here for many years as well. Meta, if you wouldn't, uh, that's kind of annoying, but. Um, it's called Qual Perinoto Calle, and it is 
a piece that was done for my brother and the countertenor Anthony Roth Costanzo several years ago, how many years ago? Three years ago by choreographer Troy Schumacher. Um, you guys can come out on stage. Thank you. Um, and because Anthony is an opera star, it's a very difficult to schedule him for summer festivals. Um, last year, I think you were in Glyndebourne and could not be here, but when he sort of emailed me that he thought he had this one week free, we, we jumped on it and I sent a million emails to your managers, so thank you for being here. We're happy to have you. First time this singer's been to a festival. Um, Anthony is a countertenor, um, and I don't know, not everybody here was at our special talk last night about the making of this piece, but maybe if you can speak to us a little bit about the music and your singing before we do some of the dancing bits. Sure. Um, if you haven't heard a countertenor or don't know the whole lineage, we basically are singing Baroque music. Most of our repertoire is Baroque music that was sung by castrated men in the 18th century, which is a serious cross to bear. But it was... Uh, <laughs> No, it was a fascinating period of history where um, boys were being castrated so they could keep their high voice. And all of the greatest composers from Monteverdi through Handel, Gluck, Mozart, Vivaldi are writing for these singers. And they're, be they're the stars of opera. And they really took opera to its popular uh, sort of status. And for 100 years, they reigned supreme. And they were the highest paid singers. So Vivaldi wrote this cantata for one of these castrati, and what I do um, is sort of approximate that sound by singing in a falsetto, which is basically like a head voice of a woman. Um, and all it means is that I'm phonating with my vocal cords sort of precariously placed like you'd stretch a rubber band to make it higher when you pluck it. Um, I'm stretching out my vocal cords so that they can sound higher, uh, but then I'm making the sound itself as approximated, as full, and uh, hopefully as um, sort of powerful as a normal opera singer. So that's the gist of it. And in our talk last night, Troy said something that I thought was very interesting because this, uh, this cantata is something that deals with loss, the loss of a person or the loss of a memory of a person and perhaps getting this person back, but maybe not. Um, and there, is a, there will be a translation of the text in your program, so you, I would suggest reading it before before watching, but maybe if you could speak about that a little bit in your choreographic process, and then you know maybe that can lead into some of the. Did you work out with them with the? But we can just okay. So one of the things that's super interesting about the libretto for this cantata is that it goes in between being in first person and third person, and also second person at times, and. I thought it was really fascinating because I was tasked with this idea of placing both Anthony and Jared in the space together. And I thought, why would just have Anthony stand there and Jared dance when I could have them really interact? And the words for this piece really make that possible. And it's, I wanted to create a story for myself to help me choreograph the piece and leave quite a bit of ambiguity for the audience to experience something. But one thing, as we're staging this ballet, there are so many different moments, especially for Anthony, where he has to know where to be looking and what he's feeling. And there's several moments, is Jared there? Is Jared not there? Are Jared and Anthony the same person? And there's not one truth to the whole piece, but it really varies throughout. And speaking with Tyler, we thought it would be interesting to show you three different examples of where, for me, it's each one of those ways, whereas for you, you can all decide. So should we do a few little excerpts? I can. I think what we should do is we should do the first recit, um, and which, yeah, so yeah, we can just do that. We'll do the whole thing. How about that? Yeah.
Thank you. So kind of what you're seeing here is when this piece begins, you have kind of these two separate worlds where in my mind, it's almost, you see Jared walking out and it's almost in like a, a thought bubble in Anthony's head. And as Jared, Anthony is singing about what is happening to Jared. And slowly Jared approaches Anthony and these two worlds converge into what is apparent reality. And Anthony looks over and he sees Jared's hands and wrists and all of a sudden it creates this really intense emotional reaction. And then he starts thinking, and then he looks back and Jared's not there anymore. And then all of a sudden he feels his presence, and then he just kind of relaxes into the comfort of this idea of Jared. And then all of a sudden he's lifted off of his feet by this memory. So that's kind of this, this way of, is Jared there, is he not? But then all of a sudden he's very much so doing something to Anthony. So um, should we do another excerpt? Uh, and then there's one more that I thought would be interesting because as this piece ends, all of a sudden they kind of come together at moments as one uh, a singular force. So I thought we could do the beginning of the second aria of the piece. Um, and we could do the end of the recit. So you kind of notice Anthony in the style of singing, which is Kalatora, is that correct? Yes, it's very, um, you know, several notes going up and down and up and down. And throughout this, you know, experience between the two of them, we get to this moment where they're slowly each, these two characters are coming to terms with what is happening to them. And you see Jared with, through each of these movements is slowly following the note pattern of Anthony's singing and then all of a sudden it just kind of bursts apart and then they're interacting once more with each other. And you, Jared is kind of slowly encircling his presence around Anthony as Anthony is ultimately going through this thing. So that's another example of how these two uh, characters are interacting. Um, do you have anything? Who I would personally, well, it's, there's two things. <laughs> Who is this harder for? So this, I think that this piece is very unique because they're both on stage together for 13 minutes, which for a dancing thing, as a, the only person really formally dancing on stage, a 13 minute dance is pretty challenging, um, I would say, to say the least. And we just, we ran through the piece a few hours ago for the first time on the stage, and it's pretty, hard. But at the same time, is this piece uh, challenging for you to sing? Yeah. Uh, it's, al it's also hard because um, we're both being sensitive to one another in different ways. And since I'm not a dancer, he has to sort of watch out for me because I could appear in the wrong spot or do the wrong thing with my body. Likewise, um, I am not only doing the staging 
or choreography. They're sort of both for me. Um, but I am, you know, going through all of these notes that you just heard in my head and trying to sort of do the vocal things as well as all of the other things and be sensitive to what Jared needs. For example, when he's doing turns sometimes, um, I don't want to be too close because I know if I'm too close it makes it more difficult. So I'm sort of trying to be aware of things I don't usually have to deal with because most of the time with other opera singers on stage you can get as close or it's better to stay as far away as, as possible. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the harpsichord and the cello will actually be on the stage for this piece in, in the back. So it essentially has turned into a, it's like a full staging mini opera. It looks amazing. Um, and we happen to have had a harpsichord donated to us for the, for the use of the festival from the island, which is exceptional. Um, okay, the last thing on the program is an excerpt from Jerome Robbins' The Four Seasons, uh, a ballet that he did, which to me is total tongue-in-cheek. Like, the entire thing is just, it's one of the most sort of jokey he ever got in a ballet, and I don't even mean jokey, if, if anyone's familiar with Jerome Robbins, in the middle of uh, classical ballet, he might sometimes just throw in a cartwheel just because he thought that it made everybody look a little more human, or he would have in one ballet, you know, three people down in that corner actually go sit off the edge of the proscenium and dangle their legs into the orchestra pit. Um, he's the, you know, he conceived and choreographed West Side Story, so you get an idea that, of, you know, what he was doing. In the Four Seasons, he worked in a completely balletic idiom, but sort of mined a, a sort of a, an old comic opera, um, very Italianate style of theater um, for the work. And that's what I'm about to demonstrate. But first of all, Wow, I just I, I lost the ability to speak there for a second. Um, there is a corps de ballet in this last section, but it's not a corps de ballet of women, it's a corps de ballet of men. And unless you're going to see something like Spartacus or I don't even know what else, maybe George Balanchine's Common Music, you really never see a corps de ballet of gentlemen. But here are our corps de ballet of gentlemen. Yep. All from, um, all from New York City Ballet, we have Ralph Ippolito, Joshua Thieu, Austin Laurent, and Andrew Scordato. Um, thank you. Um, maybe let's just do... You don't want to run the whole thing, do you? Okay, they're prepared for it. I think we should just see the whole thing. Um, and even from the very way it starts, over the top and kind of unexpected, um, you'll, you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, it was fast. It was good. It was good. Um, so you see what I mean. You know, it starts out in the beginning with, you know, four guys, and then all of a sudden, all four of them look, and the other one's up in the air. Um, but there are no cartwheels in it. You know what I mean? Like, he's using, he's using a fully balletic idiom, but, I mean, he's being very hokey. The whole thing is really, really hokey. Um, there's an amazing part, and this is... It had nothing to do with it, but it's like literally a jerry rig. Um, 
It's when, if, 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 I don't know if you notice at the end, but there's one part where everybody's in a square. Maybe just go to where the, the Padishahs start. And so in this dance that's kind of funny and silly, all of a sudden they're going to start moving in, in a very complex, super interesting to watch pattern. So if you could just go to the first half, the first guys go over this way, and the second people come this way. And then they switch and turn in on themselves and face one another. And this is all happening one count apart. And then, yeah, the same thing happens with these guys. And what you can watch for in the show to see if Andrew does it well is at some point when he has his back facing you and he does a glissade which always changes legs or always should change legs. And he does a pot shop. He keeps this foot off the floor, slides around, and does another glissade and another padasha facing back. Why don't you show us that? <laughs> I'm going to make you show us this. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I mean, he's... A so you have, these sort of, you have these sort of macro jokes, which are very apparent. You know, you see that all the guys, you know, they're looking, you know, someone's up on one count, and maybe the other person should be up, and they're all looking to see who actually should be up in the air at what count. But then you also have these little things, which when you're dancing it, can sometimes put you on the edge of hysterics on the stage, because you're watching one of your colleagues deal with, and it's probably one day in rehearsal, Jerry would just like didn't like that person who was, you know, and he like made them do this crazy thing. Guys, thank you very much. So that's the program. I hope you enjoyed. There are many other sections of that last spring part, but I thought, you know, that's also fun to have you see them for the first time here. Um, we were also very fortunate that the trust, that the Robbins Rights Trust, let us excerpt uh, this ballet. But it was fascinating because, I mean, I thought it was never going to happen, but I, I would write the email anyway. And I discovered in this process that the spring section from this ballet was actually done before all of the other sections. He did it as a, you know, for a studio showing in practice clothes. And it wasn't until this was done and people sort of liked it that he decided to fill out the rest of the ballet. So I thought that was, did you, I'd, I'd, never, I'd never known that. Um, thanks guys, you can head out if you want to. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, as the dancers are all getting ready, they're prepping for our uh, dress rehearsal, which happens in a few minutes. I thought I'd open it up and see if I can answer any of your questions or assuage any of your fears about the program. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, I think it was for him. He was explaining to us last night that dancers all, I mean, and this is accurate, when dancers breathe, we breathe up and in, and everything is held, and we're keeping everything compact and tight. And for a dancer to have a, I mean, and for a singer, excuse me, to have a good sound, the diaphragm, every, you have to go down and out and keep a relaxed middle. So there are several times where you'll see Jared in the, coming behind Anthony and having to lift him. And I watched a few of the rehearsals, and a few of the first rehearsals, Jared were... Jared would be starting to lift Anthony, and Anthony would kind of, it was like he would slump and almost look like he was falling out of Jared's arms. And they worked on it so he was able to continue his note, but also hold himself enough so it looked like he was floating. Because this is the thing, you know, ballerinas do this naturally. I mean, and it's exceptional because sometimes if you dance with, a, you know, a very young girl who's not used to being partnered, she doesn't know how to hold her back in a way that makes a lift easy. Um, Senior ballerinas obviously know how to do that very well, and you'll see actually in the spring excerpt, which is going last on the program, at what point the two guys, not me, I'm dancing around on my own, I've lifted Sarah enough at that point, two guys in the back come running out, and one tosses her in this huge jump, and the other one catches her. You know what I mean? And you're allowed to go, because oh, it looks kind of crazy, but if she didn't know how to hold her back and keep everything settled, she'd come crashing down to the floor. So suffice to say, we worked on it with Anthony a little bit, and he, you know, is an exceptional um, 
stage presence, and he, you know, he's the consummate professional on the stage. He was able to very quickly see the difference and modify this so the lift looked wonderful. But that's some of the stuff that he had to deal with to make it highly integrated. Um, for a festival like this, when you're um, kind of thinking about what pieces to include, um, and for those people who weren't, you know, lucky enough to come to this lecture demonstration, how does that affect what you decide to put in? You know, for people who have had the benefit of listening to you or have been to the ballet and, um, you know, have a sense of it, of the art form, um, how much does that impact your decisions as you're um, working? I mean, my f actually, as you were asking the question, I think my first response would have been like, a lot. I think about it, I think about the audience a lot. I do think about them a lot, but I also, I think the first, my first impulse is to just show good work. Good work speaks for itself. Good work, I think, is also much, um, much easier to understand even for people that don't have a history with the art form. That being said, Nantucket always presents an amazing problem. We have a dance going audience that is already on the island, that is highly educated, that sees everything, um, that is aware and informed and you know up on it. And then we have people that are coming for the first time. So it always presents a sort of interesting, um, you know, it's an interesting problem. How do you bridge the gap? How do you do something that's not a snooze for some people or a snooze for another group of people? I mean, I could, you know, have the old war horses up here, and a lot of the people that see ballet every other weekend in New York would be like, oh my God, we've seen this so many times. But maybe the other people would really enjoy it, and vice versa. So it's always, it's the kind of thing where you, you do have to think about the audience, but I think my first, you know, like my first impulse is just to show good work, because that's really, that's, you know, the, from the, the strongest way that you can make an argument is with, is with good work. I must have spoken a lot. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. But actually, before you leave, sorry, I forgot. We had Dave Blowers here from Northern Trust, which is our lead festival sponsor. So thank you very much for that. And he would like to say a few words. Thank you, Tyler. Tyler Engel, ladies and gentlemen. Although, Tyler, I, I think Jared may be going for MVP this year. <laughs> it's great. I, I'll tell you, this is my fourth time of being here at the Nantucket Dance Festival, and each time it ends, I think to myself, oh my God, this was so fantastic. How will we do this even better next year? And, and somehow, through Tyler's hard work, the incredible talent that we get here, and your creative genius, it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. It's in a very exciting time, I think, for dance in America. We've got dance uh, on Broadway and American in Paris and on the town. We've got the Misty Copeland phenomenon. We've got great, uh, outstanding young composers like Troy and Justin, Christopher Wielden winning the Tony Award. But I think everybody knows, at least everybody that's in this theater, that the place to be for dance in America the fourth weekend in July is right here on Nantucket Island. So, we at Northern Trust are so delighted to again serve as the lead presenting sponsor to join so many uh, incredibly generous individuals in the sponsorship of this great event. We are also very careful about who we partner with and we are so thrilled to be partnered with, again, with the Nantucket Athenaeum founded in, I, I did a, because I, I did this last year sort of on the fly, and <clears throat> I just want to do some numbers here. Uh, Anthony M. founded in 1834. Northern Trust founded in 1889. ABT, celebrating its 75th anniversary, I'm a trustee, in 1940. New York City Ballet, 1948, 67 years, coming up on 70. Miami City Ballet, 29 years. That's 478 years of institutional excellence, quality, expertise, and, and integrity, bringing this event to all of you together. So 
we doff our hats to Molly and Maggie and the Anthony M staff, to Bob and the board of directors, to Denise, Jane, and Susan and the dance committee, and to all of you for really making this possible. And I know this is going to be a great weekend and a wonderful weekend of, of island camaraderie. So I'll turn this back over to you, Tyler. I have nothing more to say. Well, if you have kids, tomorrow morning at 11, we have a marvelous children's program that, again, Dave, Jared's going to run, because I figure, you know, if I'm bringing him here, it's got to make him do the work. Um, it's my older brother, if the, you know. Um, but it's an amazing children's program always. Last year, we almost had 150 kids. We have kids from the, from the Boys and Girls Club coming over from different camps on the island. And we've teamed up, and this is our third year or fourth year, third year with an amazing um, illustrator named Doug Salati that has done booklets for us for the kids to take home. They really enjoy it. So um, if you have children, bring them tomorrow. If not, we'll see you at the shows. Thank you for coming. Thank you.